Hello everyone, this is Barry, also known as Ebenezer, on Twitch, Instagram, YouTube, several places. Um, today I wanted to go over how I painted this little hourglass, but there's a lot of information here, the video is kind of long, so I just wanted to go over several things, starting with on the video you can see I'm setting up my web palette. This is just a Masterson's web palette that I use. I bought like a Swedish dish towel, but what I really wanted to show you is how full with water I get it. It is level with the top of the sponge, and the sponge is completely saturated. I use just Reynolds um, parchment paper, which you can find in the kitchen section of any grocery store. Um, so you can see that this dish towel that I bought is perfect. It is absolutely perfect. It fits in the tray, but then on the sides, I've got this little gap where I can get water if I need to thin down my paints a little bit more. Um, and then I'm just smoothing out the palette to make sure that uh, the paint, sometimes the palette will pucker or um, pull up off the sponge and then it pushes my paint around and sometimes it pushes the paint um, together, which is not what I'm looking for. And you'll see later in this video that actually happens to me, but it's my fault. So here's my first color I'm gonna use today. I'm just gonna put colors on the palette. This is just a uh, Vallejo model color white. Um, it's thick. I like this one. Uh, as far as white, it's bright. Um, but I don't use it a lot because it is so thick. And you'll see as I go through this, I'm going to do a lot of glazing. Um, and when you do glazing, you thin your paint really, really thin. It gets watery. You'll see as I go, I try to show how thin I get my paints. Um, uh, the second color is Pale Sand from Vallejo Model Color. All my colors are Vallejo Model Color today, except for one ink I use. Uh, so right here you'll see that this, I have a local gaming store that, uh, it's a hobby shop, and the guy that runs it is a really old guy, really nice guy, but some of his paints are really, really old. <laughs> so I picked up this bottle one day, I shook it in the store, it made a noise, so I knew it was pretty solid inside, but I still bought it, I, I can still work with it. Next color is uh, Vallejo Game Color, Desert Yellow. And really these two colors are um, to make the sand that's inside the hourglass. But I use the uh, pale sand a little bit sometimes to highlight the blues I'm also going to incorporate as I'm making this. Next color is Vallejo Model Color, Medium Blue. And I'm going to make this... Um, Hourglass, I don't want it to stick out too much on the shield because the shield's pretty busy, but it needs to be painted with something. So I'm going to use this blue to kind of give it sort of a metallic feel. It's going to be kind of non-metallic metal, but not very reflective. The blue just kind of helps sell that uh, like brush steel kind of look. Uh, next color is Vallejo Model Color German Gray. I love this color. It's very, very dark, almost black. So I can really do a lot of uh, grayscale with this color. I can go from super light gray by mixing in white all the way up to almost black. But then I still have room to use actual black for a shadow of this. So it's a very nice color to paint black. Next color, of course, Leo model color, black. So uh, this black I'm just going to use to darken the other colors. And I'm going to use it straight um, as a little bit of a contrast at the end to make sure that my shadows are super dark. The next thing I'm going to use is a staple that I use all the time. It's going to be Liquitex white acrylic ink. I use white acrylic ink all the time because the pigment is super super intense but I can still it still goes on thin enough that I can layer it up so I'm not really stuck with a super bright spot um, unless I really want it. So I use the white to lighten the other colors sometimes and then for highlights. Next thing, absolute staple on my palette, always go with the airbrush medium. I have a uh, brand of golden for this. I always put a little bit of this up in the corner of my palette so that when I glaze, if I really want to get a paint super thin, I'll grab just a dot of this airbrush medium and it helps the paint from just breaking when you thin it too much of water. Water can cause a paint to just literally um, kind of self-destruct in front of your eyes if you get it too thin. And the medium helps it kind of go thin but still be um, a binder for the pigment. 
All right, this is the shield I want to work on. It's the Primaris Captain Space Marine. Got in a box set with some other guys. I've painted the whole thing except for that little hourglass he's holding right there. Um, so I just wanted to show you how I go about getting a, a metallic effect with opaque paints, without uh, metallic paints, um, that looks reflective but it's not like chrome like super duper highly reflective it just has a little bit of reflection to it you can kind of see what i'm going to do in the halo around the skeleton's head on the shield all right i'm going in for the dark gray i'm gonna start with that um and what i'm doing is just trying to drag out a little bit of it um, so i'm just sort of dragging it away from the puddle i got there because i'm going to add some water actually i'm going for my acrylic uh, i'm sorry my um medium airbrush medium and you can see as soon as I added that little drop of medium how that paint changed it started to flow it started to stretch is it the only word I can think of it stayed paint but it got transparent and you see when I'm putting it on I can still see that base color through it and this this model was completely um, primed in black and then I did a white xenophil highlight with the white acrylic ink so this is white that I'm painting right now. And you can see I'm putting that super dark gray on, but it's, it's, it's still transparent. It's more like a glaze. Because I don't want to totally lose that brightness underneath. I still want there to be a little bit, when I start adding the blues later, to kind of mimic a reflection of the sky, which is really why we have blues, to make a metallic color. Um, I still have a little bit of luminosity from that white underneath. That I'm going to be able to play off of as I start adding the blues later. So I'm just going to do a couple of coats of this super thin um, German gray. Um, the one thing about this gray is it's great color. I really like Bleo model colors. Um, and because of how I did that dollop of paint on my wet palette, I have it at 100% thickness and then I pulled away a little bit to be able to make a, a wash consistency of it. But at any time right now, if this is too thin, if I'm not getting the coverage I'm really looking for, then I could just go back into the puddle where it's still 100% and grab that and use that on the model where I need it to be a little more opaque, a little, a little darker. Um, so I still have that ability to go back and forth. And you know, I put that drop of airbrush medium right next to the color. And eventually what will happen is the color will just wick in that, that um, medium. And that's okay, because it's, it's just a binder for the paint. Paint already has medium in it holding the pigment together. And if it starts to pull that in a little bit, it, it won't really cause any trouble at all. I just like to give myself a little bit of flexibility on the palette to be able to um, adjust what I'm doing on the fly. So um, that's why I just add a little bit of medium in the end. You see, I'm not dipping right into the center of that paint. I'm just grabbing the very edge. Um, and this helps from, it, you know, when you point your brush at an angle as you approach your puddle of paint on your palette, um, if you put it dead in the middle, your brush is going to act like a wick. It's just going to pull paint into itself because it's already moist with water. But when you kind of turn your brush to its side just a little bit and you uh, sweep it back and forth that way, you'll wick up paint, but you won't suck it straight into the ferrule. <laughs> and then that's very helpful because, you know, with uh, higher priced brushes that have Kalinsky uh, sable hair in them, they, they are not happy if you get paint into the ferrule. Um, I do it all the time, but when it happens, I have some heavier duty um, brush cleaner that I use. It's a Winsor Newton cleaner. And I just dunk them in it and let them hang overnight in a little stand I have with the tip down so that they can kind of uh, break down any paint that got up close to the ferrule. And then I use a, a brush preservative like Masters to go in and uh, clean them up the rest of the way. Now this skeleton, this he's got a fistful of beads and they're I think they're the chain that connects that hourglass that he's holding. It's like uh, 
the chain that, that is connected to it. So it's sort of dangling there, I guess. It's very difficult, though, because it's hard to tell. It's right where his knuckles would be. So it's kind of hard to tell, like, is this his knuckles or is this the chain um, of beads? Uh, but I wanted them all to be the same. I didn't want to do a chain that was, like, gold and then, uh, you know, a black or dark steel hourglass. Um, so I just painted them to match. And that way I can just have one set of colors on the palette to do the chain and the hourglass. I try not to overload my palette. I don't have a lot of time to paint. So um, what palette works perfect for me, um, but I have to be careful uh, I don't overload it with all kinds of colors because you'll see me start mixing. Um, I'll mix between values a lot of times so I can turn three colors I'm going to use into 12 <laughs> very quickly. Um, so if if I get crazy and put too many colors on the start with, by the time I mix them all up through the values, I run out of room. So I try to stay with one color and knock that color out on the model. If I had several parts of the model that were all going to be this color, um, I would paint them all right now. In fact, this space marine is a dark angel space marine, which is a very dark green, his armor. His armor covered most of the model. It was the highest majority of surface area was going to be green. So I just started off by painting the whole thing green with an airbrush. I did a first highlight of a lighter green, and then I went back and um, worked up all the greens until they were all done. Then I moved on to uh, everything that was going to be the base coat of brown, which I do for the purity seals, the cloth, and the gold that's on him. Right. You see, I'm mixing that uh, dark gray a little thicker because I wasn't happy at how, how many coats it was taking me just to get the base down. So I went back up into the puddle on the palette a little further so I had more of a, of a um, concentrated pigment. So it would take me less times, less passes to finish this up. But this gray is almost black. So you can see how the white that was under this is really maintaining um, a brightness to the gray I'm applying. Using a size one Monument Hobbies bomb wick igniter brush right now. It's a really good tip, um, but it's it, it, it's not holding its point as well as it did when I first got it, which is inevitable with every brush. Really like these brushes. They are Kalinsky Sable. Um, they're not expensive if you're in the U.S. They, uh, this company is based in Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, I believe. And um, great company. The guy who owns the company is a hobbyist. He does paint miniatures. He sells a line of paint called Pro Acryl. It's supposed to be really good. I don't have any yet. And his brushes are really good. And he can really paint. All right, I'm showing you my wet palette a little bit now because I'm going to move on to another color. I'm grabbing a little bit of that. Uh, game color white, the Vallejo game color white, and I'm mixing it in with just a little bit of gray. Now I'm only painting this tiny hourglass, so I don't have to make like this huge swatch on the palette to make this gray. Um, so I just grab some white, I mix enough in that I can see that I'm going to see a difference. And I'm out of shot. There we go. Good job, Barry. Then I'm going to go in and add the negative space, the blank space inside of the hourglass. So all I'm doing here is kind of going in and saying, this is a spot that has nothing in it. So it should just be clear glass through the middle. And by doing this technique of the gray on top, see I'm adding the negative space on the bottom where there's no sand. Gray is amazing for this. It literally, when I do this part, I wouldn't have to even touch this again to do the sand. It it just makes it look like it's empty clear glass. It's, it's kind of a neat trick. Just a light gray. And then I'm going to go back right now because acrylic paint is transparent. So you can take one paint and if it's thin enough, like mine is here, I'm doing almost like a, a glaze. And I'm adding a little bit more white now so I got a little more difference in tone but when you apply acrylic paint it 
it never stays as bright or as opaque as it looks when you apply it. You touch it with your brush to the model and it looks super bright. Watch how bright this looks when I put that on there. Wow, like that's a big difference. But as that dries, it will diminish in its value. So you can kind of see here what I'm doing is kind of putting a small sort of um, reflection and a little bit of gradation so that this looks empty. Because if you look at a curved piece of glass, it usually has a reflection and then you can kind of see through it to the back of the glass. Um, and I'm trying to mimic that look right here with this color in the empty section of the glass. See, I just I just added the same color again. Let's see how instantly it looks brighter. So you can just layer the same color over and over with acrylic paint. And if you make the layer a little smaller every time, you'll get a smooth transition. So every time I paint with the glaze, I usually paint the same color several times so that I get um, that buildup of paint and the pigment. So and you can see it more and more as you go. I'm adding a little more white now, I'm working my way up. Let's do that little spin on the on the palette so that it brings my brush back to a sharp point before I get to the model. Back into that spot and just add a little bit of glint in there, the glint reflection where it gets a little brighter. We'll talk a lot about glints. <laughs> and then on the bottom I do the same thing in the empty space in the glass. Now you can see that it looks pretty good, honestly, right there. I don't really need to do anything. Later I add in the sand, and when I started painting the sand, I realized I probably didn't even need to touch this. I could have just left it the way it was. Um, but the, the buildup of the white into the gray and increasing that uh, opacity as you go with each layer of the, of the glaze is a good trick to get a smooth transition and that's why in my style the way I paint you'll see a lot of that you can see it in the model that there's this smooth kind of transition to I try to do it to everything All right now I'm going into the blue I'm just gonna go with straight straight blue and a little bit of that uh, dark gray that I got on my palette because what I'm aiming for is a um, sort of a sky reflection to make it look reflective without being overly sharp reflections like highly highly polished becomes almost a mirror like chrome and everything is uh, everything in that chrome is super detailed super crisp except at the edges where things might curve then they get a little um, refracted and they look a little different but on something that's not super reflective um, you really just need to uh, give the idea that there's a there's a bright spot that represents the sky reflecting in it there's a dark spot that rep represents you know the ground or shadow and then a little bit of blue helps sell it because it looks like the sky and your brain knows through your whole life it has learned that something that is reflective Usually the bright spot is from above in the sky. So I add a little bit of blue, your brain's like, okay, that's that's a reflection. <laughs> it's it's honestly non-metallic metal. The whole thing is just about tricking your brain into seeing what you have seen in your life, your whole life, on reflective surfaces. And I think I'm gonna do a video about how that works in the future. Alright, I worked up my bluish gray here. Um, I've got two different uh, values. You can see how my wet palette can really become overrun. <laughs> I use an old brush to mix those together. Now I got my uh, my Bombwick igniter back to go with the detail. I'm trying to keep this palette in frame pretty zoomed in so you guys can see what I'm doing. Now I'm just thinning that down. I grabbed a little bit of um, the medium, just a touch, and now I just went to the side of the palette and grabbed some water. And you can see how thin I'm actually going to make this mix and what I do is look at the way the consistency of the paint to know if I have it right it'll get this quality where it'll start to pull back when you mix it and spread it and then let go it'll like pull itself back into um, droplets almost that's when I know I'm pretty close to that glazing uh, consistency perfection the glazing for me 
which is what I'm doing now. I'm just catching the the edge, the outer rim of this hourglass, which is going to be pretty reflective. It's going to be pretty noticeable. Um, and then these uprights. And all I'm doing here is kind of dragging that glaze across the surface. And I know where I want my highlight to be. And when you glaze, you want to pull color to the point where you want the most saturation and then lift. Uh, when you lift at that point, you leave more pigment right there. And another very important thing about glazing when you're doing this, you can't see it, but off camera I have a paper towel sitting next to my uh, palette. So when I'm doing this, I get that paint super thin to be a glaze. I get it on my brush, and then I immediately take my brush off the palette to this uh, paper towel I have folded up next to me, and I touch the brush on it to get all the paint, well, I shouldn't say all of it, most of the paint out. Basically, when you paint with this stuff, you don't want to leave this giant puddle every time you move it right and that's what happens if you uh, get too much paint in your brush because the glaze is super thin like water um, so I pull a lot of the paint out of it and then when I go to the model I just have like this smooth thin coverage and there's not a lot of paint there for it to build any kind of puddle at the end but it does still leave a tiny puddle when I pull it the brush away so you'll see as I, I do the edges on this hourglass, I'll drag from one side over to the middle where I want the light to be, and then I'll go to the other side and drag it back to that same middle point. And by doing that, I leave this trail of glaze that is very thin on the outside, and it's it's got a lot of pigment in the middle where I want that light to be. So you have to sort of control where you lift the brush and lift right in that sweet spot where you know that highlight needs to be. Doing the same on the little posts on the side, I'm dragging that pigment up and it's leaving, where I lift the brush, it's leaving like a little more pigment there and it creates a super smooth gradation transition from the coat that was under it to the pigment I'm laying on top. So I have dark gray and I'm pulling this uh, dark gray blue up and because it already has that dark gray in it, you just see the blue, but it helps with that transition to go up. And what I'm building up to is the glint at the end, which is that highest point of reflection where the sun is really bouncing off of this semi-polished uh, finish. Um, and again, the more reflective something is, the more harsh your details in the reflections need to be because they'll almost look like a photograph as you get there. Now I'm working the top of this thing. Another thing a trick to non-metallic metals is never have your highlights in the same place on different planes. So if you think of a cube, right, it's got several sides and wherever you highlight one side, um, where the next plane, like the top of the cube, meets that point, make that your shadow. By doing that, you create a ton of contrast. All right, I'm going up to the, the lighter mix I did here, um, adding some water and a little bit of medium to it. And then I'm going back in and I'm going right back to the same spots, but I'm going to make it a little smaller, a little smaller. I'm dragging that puddle of pigment right to the center where I want it to be. It's a teeny tiny puddle. Puddle's probably not even a good word, but I'm building up to that that glint at the end that's going to be the true reflection of whatever the light source is. It's just the same motions again, I'm just using a little bit lighter of a mix of the blue and the gray. I'm going to hit a little bit of light in there. I'm going to hit that little center section, this little piece of metal in the middle between the top and the bottom of the hourglass. And then I have to do the same thing on these beads, they're round, so they should be dark on the bottom with its um, highest reflection when the lights are source on the top, if that's where your light source is coming from. If we were doing like an OSL effect where there was light coming up from the bottom, you would do that in reverse. It would be darker on top and lighter on the bottom, right? Because that light source is going to be in relation to where the light is coming from. I'm dragging this, I'm being careful on the top here because I want there to be a highlight there. It's the biggest surface area of the metal on this hourglass. But I'm being real careful to try to drag my highest point of light 
away from where the glint is on the front edge of this hourglass. You can see my front edge, I'm putting the highlight, I'm doing another layer of the same color there to intensify it. Doing it right about left to center on both these front planes. It's important that they're in the same place, right? Because that's going to sell that reflection. They have to line up on the front of it. But on the top, I've tried to push the highlight over towards the right side. So those two uh, reflection points do not intersect. You want that uh, contrast between those two highlights so that they pop out more. Otherwise, it turns into kind of like a, a mess. You can't really tell what's going on, and it doesn't. It loses that metallic effect. Going back in for another coat or another glaze of this color. And now I'm going to make a really tiny section right on the very point where I want that uh, glint of light to be at the end. And I, I didn't want metallics this way. You can see on the on the shield, the gold in and around the outside of it. I build up to a point, and then I almost just like put a a, a circle, like a just an intentional dot of paint that's not um, a smooth transition because that's kind of how light's going to reflect back at you. If it's bright, it's it's not going to be. Um, filtered through layers of the metal's color, it's going to be an actual reflection of what's causing the light. So I tend to try to make it a little bit drastic and it looks good in a small scale. It helps sell that uh, sense of true reflection, in my opinion. No, that's the way I do it. All right, I'm going back into these beads and hitting the top edge with this lighter color now in a small spot because I want to um, sell the perception of them being orbs that are reflecting light because they're round like a ball they're going to specifically have a highlight uh, on the surface of them in a very particular spot all right now i'm going into that yeah i'm just i'm just um finishing up all my higher scale on the or that's where i see it and some spots are going to have like every spot should be uniform at this point. Whatever spot is at this highest scale right now, everything on the hourglass needs to be at that scale. Every highlight I'm building up. If not, it's gonna look weird when I put that final highlight on. So it's gotta be real smooth. And again, I'm not making this color brighter. I'm not mixing white in it. I'm just keep glazing it up, which makes the pigment thicker and thicker as I go. And if I glaze it into a smaller area each time, shrinking the amount I'm doing, then I'm building up uh, a gradient very smoothly because I'm using very little pigment at a time. Now I'm adding a little bit of white ink in there. Uh, I like the white ink because it's got strong pigment, but I don't need to really add any more water um, because it's, it's so thin. Um, now this will be potent, I know it, because I'm using white ink and there's a ton of pigment in white ink. Um, it's very smooth, which works well when I'm doing glazes. And I know now i got to be really careful because this is going to be way brighter. But if you see, I'm still doing that motion where I'm dragging it into a puddle in the middle. And and you can tell right there, that that's a very smooth blend. And I didn't really put a lot of effort into it. It's all technique, it's all about layer in those glazes slowly and if you watch that spot I just painted on the edge of that um, hourglass you'll notice it slowly uh, loses its intensity as it tries <laughs> so that's why I do several coats when I'm doing glazes over the same spot it just keeps building up that pigment I left a little gap at the top of those posts on the sides of the hourglass because my light source is above so it's going to leave a little bit of shadow right under the top lip of that uh, hourglass. So it should be a little shadow area before the light can reach it because it's coming down from above. Um, that helps sell that reflective look. On the top, uh, because it's a flat surface, my highlights are going to be kind of in a circular pattern. They're going to be circular instead of being um, 
linear like they are on the sides of the posts. And the trick I learned about glazing is remember I said when you pull the paint and then lift, you leave like a little bit of a um, puddle of pigment right there, the strongest spot. So what I do on flat areas or curved areas where I need a circular highlight, I will um, basically draw a circle. I'll, I'll make a circle and then I'll put my brush tip to the very center of that circle I pulled and then I'll lift. And that leaves all the pigment near the middle. So you basically create a transition uh, by, by drawing a little circle and pulling the brush out of the center. Just a tip. Not found. All right, I'm still using that same mixture and I'm uh, reinforcing the pigment in those areas where I lift it. So I'm just making a tiny little sweep, just a tiny one so I don't get that hard edge like a, like a tea stain. And I'm just barely touching. And this is where a good brush really, really comes into play. Uh, you can see how fine the tip is on this brush and how very little of this brush I'm actually using to apply the paint. So I'm just making a small highlight. And you see right there, I make that little circle and I lift in the middle. But I'm doing it really small. Now I'm getting that really smooth, nice transition from dark to light. And you can see by looking at it, you know, that does kind of look metallic. All I did was add some uh, blue in as I did it. And then I made my highlights in a way that our brain has been trained to see metal highlights our entire lives, which is on uh, different shapes and volumes light always collects a certain way and that's all i'm doing on a curve it collects in the middle now now what i'm doing now is super important to pull off metallic anything reflective anything you absolutely have to edge highlight you have to that because anything that's reflective that has an edge it bends all the light across that edge and it reflects it it always reflects it because it takes the entire scale of what is being reflected, which let's face it, it's the entire horizon. When you have reflections, it, if you look outside, there's the ground, there's the horizon, and there's sky with the sun in it. That's what's always being reflected in anything metallic. On an edge like this that's rolled or sharp, you will see that anything that's reflective, it has to make that entire... Um, reflection of the horizon all in that pinpoint spot so it's always going to need to be edge highlighted the sun effect you can see with this guy when i started i under lighted everything with a purple because he was mostly green so i want that color theory going um by um, adding in some purple there and it's pretty striking if you look at him from the right angle you don't notice it all the time but every once in a while i look at it and see it and again, I'm doing that edge highlight, and all I'm doing is taking the side of my brush that's got paint in it and just dragging it very, very lightly across the surface of that edge. By doing that, it just barely grabs it. It's almost like um, precise dry brushing, <laughs> but it gives you that edge look. And you can see now it's really starting to look like, like a metal. All right, I'm going right back into my Vallejo White, and here we go. This is the glint, the biggest glint, highest, the, the glint Eastwood of all glints is going in now. I'm putting down this white because white can be really thick. Uh, so I'm getting pretty thin, or pretty thick, pretty thinned down, sorry. And then I'm going to pop it right onto that highest point. Boom. And I'm just going to glint it, right? I'm not going to blend anything. I'm just going to pop. There we go. There it is. That's that reflection. The glint Eastwood of all glints. And uh, this really sells. Oh my gosh, that's that's shining now. That looks like it's highly reflective. <laughs> um, and a lot of times on the edge highlight, I will catch it, the edge highlight, right where my highest um, glint is, my highest reflection point. Um, I'll also go to the edge there and do just drag a little bit of edge highlighting right next to the um, <clears throat> highest reflection and that sort of sells that that edge is also reproducing that same glint and it, it sort of pulls everything together 
So I'll make the dot, the Glen Eastwood there at the end, and then I'll, I'll grab that edge around it a little bit and sort of pull that light in. And it gives it this um, almost reflective glow that really sells well. And again, I'm doing my Glen Eastwood on the sides. Where my highest point of light is. And I, I put a little dot at the highest points, matching my light source that I use on the whole model, on those beads that he has on his knuckles there. Yep. <clears throat> that is pretty much my process for anything metallic. Now, if it's highly reflective metallic, you kind of have to mimic the horizon a little more. If it's just, just reflective metal, then you can just kind of stick with the highlight part of it and a little bit of a low light, a shadow that contrasts with it. Once you have that contrast, like from light to dark on different surfaces, it'll look reflective. But for highly reflective, you can see how thick this pale sand is I got from this guy at the hobby shop. It is a disaster. It looks like oatmeal. Uh, but it's okay, because there's enough pigment floating in there, and I've done it down so much. Oh, oh, and I just made my paints mix together, of course. Um, and again, I'm taking that, that uh, flat earth and that pale sand. And uh, the, the flat earth is a little too dark for me. It's more of a shadow color for the sand. I don't need to go that dark. But after I started mixing it and looking at all the other colors on the shield, I realized I don't even want to go straight pale sand. I just want to go with this intermediate mix between the two and then the sand. I tried to stay with the sand because it wasn't completely white. So when I put the highlights and the white and the blue next to it and the black, it would read as a totally different thing inside that, that hourglass. And if I had gotten too close to the color of the highlights, like the white, um, it would all just mush together. You wouldn't see any difference at the scale. So tiny, you have to make big contrast changes in the colors and everything else. Now what I'm doing now is making a glaze of that uh, flat earth and you'll see it's super thin and I'm just going to use it to try to just color where I know the sand's going, those white parts that I left for the material inside. And um, I just kind of glaze over that and it gives it that base color. It's way lighter than the actual pigment down there you can see right because it's so thin you can see that white right through it and I just use that to kind of start I do this all the time to gauge um, what I'm getting into right I, I use my paint so thin that once I put them down I could see immediately uh, that's that's not right or oh that's that's what I'm going for I just need to intensify it this way or that way on this one this is what told me I don't need it that dark. You can see right there. I put it in there and it just sort of disappears a little bit, right? And I didn't like that. I didn't like that. And, and you're looking at this thing at like 2000 magnification. <laughs> this shield's very small. So if you can see it at the magnification right now you're looking at, you can't see it, then it's no good. You got to go to something else. So I look at it a little bit. Like, yeah, well, let's make it brighter. So then I go back into this pale sand. Drag out a little bit, get just a tiny bit on my brush because I'm in such a small area. But I still want this to be pretty opaque. I don't want it to, um, I don't want to do 15 glazes of this. I want it to pop. And what I'm doing now is kind of draw on that edge. When you look at things through glass, they tend to have a much sharper line at the very edge of where uh, the liquid, or in this case sand, actually becomes visible to light or at the top of the liquid or the sand. So that top is usually like a lighter color and that's because the light is hitting that from the top. So when you add like a lighter color at the very edge, you give this impression that, okay, that's where the light's hitting, so everything above this is empty. That's what sells that look. If you look at anybody that uh, does a really cool effect with like a half empty vial, you'll see that their color always gets real bright at the top and then there's like a void space above it, like a gray. Um, and that just sells that, that's the top of what's in here. Right. <clears throat> at this point I'm basically looking at it going, well, I should have just not done anything to this. 
<laughs> but uh, so I'm trying to, to figure out how to sort of um, not go crazy with it. What do I need to do here to make this not you know, ruin this effect that was almost there from the very beginning when I did the, the void spaces in the gray? Um, so I just kind of and you know increase that little line um, of the edge of the sand. I wanted the top to look like it was sort of going empty, and the bottom. I knew I needed to kind of put like the sand, you know, when you pour sand through a hourglass, it makes this peak in the middle where it's falling, obviously. So I'm trying to just shape that a little bit in a way that's convincing, it sort of sells the look that there's sand in a, in a glass vial. Um, now I, I'm kind of done with that. Like I did what I, I felt like I needed to do. I thought now I need to go back and I think I'm going to just work on this glass a little bit because I sort of lost that cool transition in the void spaces. So I'm going to go back in and kind of say, you know what, this should be this nice gradation of gray up here. And I'm in, enforcing that a little bit and then uh, ultimately what I'm trying to do here is get to that the, the glass Glint Eastwood that I need to do. And here I'm just trying to build in that empty space. So you can tell there's a difference between the sand and that empty glass <clears throat> at the top. Now I know I need more contrast because this is looking pretty bright. The whole thing's looking pretty bright. That's not a good way to make your miniature pop. You need to have, with your cool specular highlights, you also need to have those really deep shadows, that, that really hardcore contrast to make everything just jump out when you're looking at it. <clears throat> so I'm looking now to see where do I need to add these black shadows to really sell what I'm doing here. So I go to the top of those <clears throat> rods, the farthest edges on the front facing edges of the hourglass case. Um, and I think I do a little bit on the back part of the top. I add a little bit of extra shadow back there. And then I'm going to put a little bit, and now I'm glazing it up here. So I'm, I'm starting in that gray, but I'm dragging it up so the pigment stops at the very top of the hourglass so that I'm not leaving any you know like heavy pigment of black down in the body of the glass I'm dragging it all up to where it meets the, the lid of that hourglass to just kind of add a lot of contrast there and you can see the difference that made now there's a really dark spot under the lid and then it gets brighter as it goes down to the sand and then that center sort of uh, napkin holder in the middle of two parts of the glass. <laughs> all right, Glenn Eastwood, going back to the white. And I do this all the time when I'm painting. I go back and forth. It's just a it's just a process. I grab some water there, threw in that white to get it as thin as I could because uh, white is thick. If you haven't heard me say that already, it does get pretty thick. And I never... I should say never. I hardly ever just use straight white unless I'm really trying to make a ridiculous blend Eastwood at the end. Um, so yeah, I, I see that the, the white has kind of lost its uh, its uh, dynamic look because, as I said, acrylic with the dries, it always goes dull. It always loses its opacity. So I'm just doing those highest highlights. I'm doing the Glen Eastwood on the, the glass of the hourglass now. Getting that built up so it's selling that reflection. And just finishing everything off at this point, making sure my, my whites are super bright in the tiniest apex of that reflection. I'm doing a little bit of a um, vertical reflection now on the other side of the glass. So I've got a smooth reflection on one side, and then I put a harsh vertical reflection on the other. And uh, glass is very reflective, let's face it. So you can have multiple reflection points on glass. Remember, a reflection is really just how 
your environment is reflecting to your eye. The, the point of the reflection is the object. So the lights above you, around you, it's coming from certain things. If this guy's standing in a, in a dungeon with uh, torches all around him and there's an opening in the roof that lights coming in from the sun, all those things can be reflective in the highest reflective surfaces. If it's really polished, the glass is so smooth, it's like it's like a mirror. So everything around is going to be reflected in that glass. Um, but the trick is, at this scale, to represent that realism and it things that are super reflective you should try to have multiple reflections on them things that aren't as reflective like this I was just going for like a brush sort of steel look on this uh, hourglass you don't have to go crazy because they're not as reflective they're not reflecting everything in perfection like a mirror they're just kind of you know bouncing back uh, a light source here and there so they can be a little less ridiculous <laughs> and you can see even on the cloth under this guy right the cloth is not very reflective but I want it to look like silk which actually is a reflective uh, 